Good afternoon. I'm Joshua Fox, Joshua Fuchs in Hebrew, a research associate with the Singularity Institute. I'm delighted that our president, Michael Vassar, could be here with us today. And I'm going to speak about anthropomorphism. I'm going to ask that we fight against our anthropomorphizing intuitions when it comes to ethics of superintelligences, which is to say, intelligence at a level far above the human. Anthropomorphism is a fundamental human bias. We anthropomorphize everything around us. We see the forces of nature like trees and rivers, and we imagine dryads and naiads. When we see pollution, we say the earth is sorrowing. We use phrases like Mother Earth. Almost all gods in human history have been anthropomorphic. They've had eyes and arms and legs, and loves and lusts. Even the few that aren't anthropomorphic were usually zoomorphic, pretty close. And today, when we see robots with cute eyes and robots that can speak and move, it's very natural to anthropomorphize them. One aspect of anthropomorphism is to make these entities into moral agents, which is to say, to treat them as having responsibility for what they do. So, uh, to take examples, we treat gods as entities that are responsible for what we think they do in the world, and not simply as abstract mathematical forces like the laws of physics. When uh, in science fiction we see robots attacking people, we think of them as evil, desiring to destroy human beings. and even trees can be treated as moral agents. Uh, today, we're not afraid of trees, but in the Middle Ages, when forests covered Europe, people saw trees, in some cases, as threatening, because, in fact, uh, well, they did threaten uh, the human farming communities by providing a, a hiding place, let's say, for animals and bandits. Of course, we know that all these anthropomorphisms are incorrect, which is something I'm going to say about superintelligent agents. At the same time, we treat these entities as moral patients, which is to say creatures that can suffer and whose suffering we should prevent. In other words, as the object of our moral concerns. So we say that uh, you shouldn't cut down trees. It's as if they're screaming. Even if they're not, we treat them as uh, objects of moral concern. Likewise, when it comes to polluting the earth, and likewise, when it comes to offending God and uh, offering sacrifices to gods, which make him happy. And likewise, also with robots. So if you think about Wally, that poor suffering Wally who needs love, or about C-3PO, who was smashed up in Star Trek, we imagine that these robots are worthy of our sympathies. And anthropomorphism is so basic to the human mental makeup that we should ask why we do it. Why do we have this tendency to interpret everything around us as human? Why don't I uh, see trees as bricks? Why don't we brick them for more pies and uh, imagine that uh, everything around us is a brick? Well, there's a good reason. That's that we humans evolved together with other humans and we developed built-in models for working with them. It's actually in our brains and we, uh, uh, on the level of hardware, it had survival value for our ancestors as they lived in tribal communities they wanted to gain social status because it helped their chances to reproduce and to survive they had to avoid betrayal by other humans so our hardware is highly optimized for dealing with humans and we reuse that hardware for what it's good for and at the same time besides the hardware level you know they talk about nature versus nurture so on the nurture level we live in a world full of humans. We interact with humans all the time, and humans are a fundamental part of our existence today as they were in the environment of evolutionary adaptivity. So this is called the availability bias. It's very easy to use concepts that are uh, ready at hand and to apply them to everything. So anthropomorphism is very basic, and in the case of uh, trees, we can easily see that uh, trees are not humans. There are two levels of anthropomorphism, though. One is the real belief that certain creatures are human-like in some way. 
So people really believe that God uh, wants certain things. Or some people really believe that the earth suffers, that plants scream when they're ripped up. But the other level is the metaphorical. And certainly, even if we work on a very rational level, we use metaphors. It's a basic way of thinking. And I can say that it's not good to cut down too many trees and treat them as a moral patient that's suffering without actually thinking that trees suffer as we do or that we should really be concerned for them as we are for humans. Two levels of anthropomorphism, one less valid than the other, both of which, though, can lead to mistakes. Now, I'm going to discuss the application of anthropomorphism to super powerful optimizers. I really mean super intelligent uh, artificial machines, AGIs, but I want to discuss optimization power today. The difference is that intelligence, as we know it, is a very complex human phenomenon. People have the ability to do lots of things, to walk, to talk. Most robots today can't do that yet. To walk, to talk, to do mathematics, to get along with other people, to lead, to follow other people. Very complex mix of abilities. And these are all very important and very useful to consider in the case of future artificial intelligences. But I want to make our discussion more abstract, precisely because I want to get away from the human model. And I want to talk about optimization power, maximizing a function of the world. So in the case of humans, we maximize a, a very complex and inconsistent function of the world state. So some things that uh, we humans want to maximize is uh, being fed, right? So make sure we're not starving, uh, getting love, getting sex, getting social status, uh, getting interesting things to do. These are all things that we strive to optimize, but very complex and not mathematical. Uh, but to think about it abstractly, we can talk about machines that just try to get something done, to achieve some goal, and to step away from narrow human conceptions. And to make it a little more specific, although I don't know in the future which uh, artificial intelligences will be developed, we can talk about two categories. One is based on the artificial general intelligence paradigm, which is to say somebody will write code based on mathematical theories of how to build intelligence. The other is brain-based. Someone will make a simulation of a brain, or someone will figure a way to plug in chips to the human brain to make it more powerful. And in that case, we have an architecture and a goal system closely based on the human model. If you ask me, I think the more likely to arise is the first, but we can consider both possibilities. Now, the second one, obviously, is anthropomorphic. If there's a creature that's built on the human model, well, then it is like humans. Today, if we build robots with an uh, arm based on the human musculature, then to some extent it is like the human arm. And that's why I'm going to focus mostly on the possibility of an artificial general intelligence, one which is coded as an optimizer to achieve goals. I'll give you some examples uh, further on so that uh, it will be a little more concrete, although, again, I do want to abstract and broaden the scope. One important fact about future artificial general intelligences is that they will be super intelligences. In other words, if we develop a flexible general intelligence, it will strive to achieve a goal that we give it. And one good way of achieving a goal is to be more intelligent. So it will buy more computer chips, it will change its own source code, it will do this because it helps it achieve its goal, whatever that goal is. Making money, winning a battle, something more complex, being super intelligent is very valuable. The human intelligence level is what we know, but let's not anthropomorphize. It's not the be-all and end-all. It's only the minimum level of intelligence needed to achieve civilization. Much more is possible. And it's likely that an artificial intelligence will achieve much more very quickly. So I'm going to focus on superintelligences and ask about their status as moral agents or patients. Anthropomorphism, as I said, has been applied to robots, trees, and so on. But it's also very easy to apply it to artificial general intelligences. They don't exist, but there is speculation about them. And from the beginning, Alan Turing, who founded so much in our field of interest, computer science and artificial intelligence, Alan Turing understood this dilemma. 
he knew that it's hard to define intelligence. Yes, we can define it as an optimization process in general, but the human model is what we have and know. So he invented the Turing test, which says that a machine can be considered intelligent if it can uh, successfully mimic human intelligence. But in that same article, he said, this is not really how I define intelligence. He said, this is a easy test. It's a tool. Let's use this tool. This is not intelligence. This is not optimization power in general, because you can have a machine that's very good at doing things. It's very good at making money, at conquering the world, at curing HIV, AIDS. But this machine is just very inhuman, very non-human, very different from us. It works in a completely different way. So he knew it from the beginning that anthropomorphism was risky. And from the beginning, people have treated these AGIs, these future AGIs, as potentially responsible for their own actions. So again, that example from Terminator of the machine which conquers the Earth, it's evil. Now, uh, it is a kind of a mechanical, metallic evil, but those red eyes tell us something. <laughs> the robot is out to get us. It seems to enjoy killing. If you uh, remember some bloody scenes in Terminator 2, there's this vision of artificial intelligences as having moral capacity, as being uh, treated the way we treat humans who commit good or evil acts. And at the same time, people have treated AGIs as moral patients. They'll often say, uh, they'll ask questions like, will future artificial general intelligences have rights? Can we harm them at will? Can we enslave them? Uh, is it immoral to pull the plug on such an artificial general intelligence in the future? Very natural question to ask, because that's what we know from our experience with humans. And humans are almost the only example of a moral agent or moral patient that we have. Now, I'm talking in this lecture about morality, about moral agents and moral patients. If, however, we consider the simple question of benefit or harm to humans, that's not anthropomorphism. So today, if a car is badly designed and people get killed, we don't say the car is evil, but we say that the situation has to be remedied. It's a very bad thing that people are hurt. And if there's a computer that uh, folds proteins and finds a, a new genetic therapy, then that's a wonderful thing. We don't praise the computer for that. And uh, we don't even reward it for, for doing good. Uh, so the mere question of what's what hurts and harms humans is of, sorry, hurts and uh, helps humans is of utmost importance, but it's not the moral question. And uh, specifically, a super optimizer, an entity capable of achieving goals with great efficiency, uh, can indeed help or harm us tremendously. That's almost by definition. We're defining an optimizer as something that can get things done, and therefore it can get this done. Our health help us or harm us uh, with great effectiveness. Uh, and this is something that we have to plan for and deal with. But now I'm separating the question of whether this entity is a moral agent or a moral patient, whether uh, this concept of morality applies to it, either on the uh, giving end or the receiving end. Now for some definitions. It's important to get these concepts right using our intuition, because that's where morality comes from. There are many definitions for these concepts, but I want to bring it down to earth for the simple reason that I want people to be moral as I understand it. And if the definition is too far removed from our intuitions, then I'm worried that the morality that will result is not what I call morality. So a moral agent is an entity which is responsible for its behavior, which is to say that we condemn it or praise it, reward it or punish it according to the way it behaves. And the only real example there is humans. Even rewards and punishments for dogs are treated as mere behavior modification and uh, not as an ascription of responsibility. A moral patient is an entity which can be on the receiving end of a uh, moral behavior. That is to say that uh, we should not cause it to suffer. We should help it achieve its goals. And those who don't 
are to be uh, condemned or rewarded if they are if they are moral agents. Morality itself, as most of us understand it, is a sort of altruism, helping other people get what they want. That is to say, they don't want to suffer, they want to feel pleasure, they have other goals. Although we should remember that that's a definition that uh, we as liberal Westerners may have, but that much of the world sees morality in other ways. So much of the world defines a morality uh, according to sexual behavior, religious behavior, and the same moral disgust that uh, we would have for someone who uh, beats their wife, many people would have towards certain sexual practices or uh, religious practices. That is how the moral feeling uh, emerges. Morality, of course, developed as a adaptation, as a way of uh, helping maximize redu reproductive fitness in the environment of evolutionary adaptation over the last few tens of thousands or last hundred thousands of years. As humans lived in a tribal society with a few dozen other people, they needed rules to agree on. If everybody has completely different rules for behavior, then uh, nothing will function. And so a shared moral sense developed. People, uh, show, that people show moral outrage, which is to say they promise to punish others who misbehave. In game theory terms, this is pre-commitment. It's saying, don't mess with me. I'm going to punish you if you do the wrong thing. Even if it's not in my best interest, I guarantee punishment. And at the same time, morality also applies to the self. People feel guilty, and that may help them uh, avoid immoral behavior, or it may help them just uh, make sure not to get caught. But uh, guilt, which developed for similar reasons of evolutionary adaptation, also applies to the self. All these are human characteristics, but seen in the context of optimizers in general, end goals are completely arbitrary. As I said, an optimizer is something that maximizes a function. So that's a function of the world around us. The function can be, I want the biggest collection of money. There are machines on Wall Street that do that today. The function of the world maximizing could be a victory, defeat of enemies in war. There are also AIs working on that today. Of course, they're not general flexible AIs. As I said, for humans, the function we maximize is very complicated and it's hard to really specify. But if we broaden our thought to all possible, functions that an optimizer might be working on, our morality means nothing to that context. Let's take some examples to see what I mean about the arbitrariness of end goals and their lack of relationship to morality. So evolution is a sort of optimizer. Of course, it's not a person, it doesn't have a body, but it optimizes for reproductive fitness in a given uh, gene, in a specific local gene pool. It does this uh, in a very inhuman way. It cannot foresee the future. It can't model, it can't plan, it can't look at mistakes and correct them. Well, it does a pretty good job of uh, making animals and uh, other life forms. It's an uh, optimizer that we sometimes can't beat. For example, uh, viruses still kill humans. So human intelligence, although it's uh, pretty powerful, is in some cases still inferior to evolution as an optimizer. A very inhuman optimizer. Markets are another optimizer. They optimize for the weighted benefit of all the participants in it. Now, uh, markets aren't perfect. There's been a lot of problems in the last few years, and they don't optimize equally for everyone's benefit. But nonetheless, uh, again, I'm not talking about these as moral agents. I'm talking about them as optimizers. And markets do a much j better job of optimizing for a weighted average of everyone's benefits than do a small group of humans. Gauss' plan in the Soviet Union was a small group of bureaucrats that did a much worse job than capitalist markets in optimizing. A couple more non-human-like optimizers. Computers today, they are not general flexible intelligences, but they can help us understand this concept of an optimizer that's quite inhuman. For example, chess playing computers play chess nothing like the way humans do. And another example is a mathematical formalism called AIXI. This is not an implemented computer, it's an abstraction, which really builds on a definition of optimization power, of intelligence. Uh, to put it very simply, 
the AIXI judges all possible actions it can take, chooses the one that will maximize its expected reward, and takes that action. And according to this mathematical formalism, it receives input, makes this decision after considering all possibilities, and executes an action over and over in the cycle that proceeds. This takes an infinite number of, of uh, cycles per second, so AXI is not directly implementable. But what's important about it is that it abstracts out the concept of optimization. AXI always wins. It chooses the best action better than any other optimizer possible. This is provable totally without regard for any of our human considerations. It can optimize for any reward function. It doesn't know the reward function in advance. It uses a trial and error in this very inhuman way. So these uh, artificial, general, artificial general intelligences or super intelligences, which may arise in the next uh, few decades, might choose to be beneficent, as humans sometimes are. I'm asking the question of whether they can be moral agents. So we should naturally ask, can they be beneficent? Can they do the right thing to help others? And there are reasons why future artificial general intelligence might do that. Uh, one is mutual help. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. If we're assuming here an entity which is at roughly human level intelligence, it may need our help to get things done. And if the most efficient way to get things done is to uh, help us, then, then it will. That makes sense. That won't happen, though, for a super intelligence, one that's so much more powerful than us that it doesn't need to trade with us, to deal with us. So it's only applicable in a narrow scope of power at the roughly human level. Another reason why future artificial general intelligences might be benevolent, which is to say uh, have a general tendency to do good, is that it helps to have a provably benevolent disposition. If you can tell people, I'm nice, then they'll cooperate with you. If, in fact, if you can show people with some evidence, even if it's not an absolute proof, they have good reason to cooperate, to play along. And what you're showing the world is that you're willing to be nice even if it loses you some opportunities. You're not scheming. We humans sometimes do that. We show people that we're uh, nice. We, that's, uh, humans have modules specially designed to detect lies. So it is to some extent possible to show others that you're nice. An artificial general intelligence could just expose its source code. And it could say, look, I'm nice, and therefore you should be nice to me. And that's a reason why a, an AGI might be benevolent. Again, though, this only applies to roughly human levels. If there's an entity much more powerful than humans, then it can lie to us about being benevolent, or it can just ignore the whole question and do it at once without our help. It's way, way beyond the human level. So in asking these questions of whether an AGI is a moral agent, we see that these human-like reasons to be moral just don't exist for a superintelligence. Here's another reason to be a moral agent. This is a rather abstract one from an excellent book by Gary Drescher. And it says that if you imagine a community of artificial general intelligences that are all built on the same source code, and if you imagine that uh, a given entity doesn't know what it will decide in the future, if it knew what it will decide, it would have already decided. <laughs> Sometimes it's thinking, trying to decide whether to do the nice thing or the nasty thing. And it says, if I choose the nice thing, that, that suggests good evidence that others are nice as well because they have the same source code as me. Now, I can't really introspect myself completely. I don't know if I'm a nice guy or a nasty guy. I don't know what I'm going to decide. But I really wish that everyone else were nice. So I'm going to choose the nice action, not because it makes anyone else be nice, but because it's good evidence that others are nice. Now, I can say, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to be nasty. And the others will be nice. No, no. Even choosing to be nasty won't make them nasty as such. But it's uh, pretty good evidence that they're nasty too, and you don't want that. The logic is a bit tricky, but it does work. However, it only works for a community of uh, peers. If you have an entity that's on a very different architecture from humans, much, much more powerful than humans, then it can say, I'm nasty, and maybe they're nice. I don't know. These two things have nothing to do with each other because I can just trample on them if I want. Notice they use the word nastiness, which is itself a moral term associated with humans. But again, this reason to be beneficent 
uh, is applicable to only a narrow band of abilities around the human level. So those are all reasons to be a nice guy, but really the ultimate reason to be nice is that it's a terminal value. It's a goal. And some humans are so saintly that for them, being nice to others is simply a goal. They're not doing it for any ul ulterior motive. And it would be really wonderful if these superintelligences simply wanted human benefit. So I'm not talking about a robot that wants what humans want, that it's altruistic, the way humans are altruistic. I'm talking about an entity that its only terminal value is human benefit. You can compare markets. So the only goal of markets, if you want to call it that, is to maximize the benefit of all the participants. Again, in a perhaps unfairly fairly weighted manner, but markets are not uh, creatures with brains. They don't have any goals of their own. On the other hand, markets are very different from the individuals within them, as we've seen in some market panics uh, in human history. And yet, nonetheless, taken as a whole, markets are optimizers that work for others. They have a terminal value, a goal, that involves others. And we can imagine a superintelligence that has been assigned this as a terminal value. What does it mean to help humans? Well, it means to help us get what we want. Because the aspect of morality that I am most interested in, as I mentioned earlier, is helping others achieve what they want. So maybe this is a form of superintelligence morality. This is what it has been assigned as a terminal value. Now, what we humans want is hard to say. We sometimes don't know ourselves. But it is a complex mixture. Love, social status, interesting things to do, joy, many things together. And that would be a form of altruism or morality in machines as we would sense it. Now, one thing that will not bring about beneficence in uh, artificial intelligences is a Kantian shift. A Kantian shift is when a human thinks about whether to be good or evil, realizes that in a society where everyone's good, everyone will benefit, and ultimately decides to have goodness as a terminal value with no instrumental considerations. However, this change of goals is a very human behavior. And it actually shows a weakness in goal optimization. After all, whatever your goal is, if you change your goal, then that change was a weakness in achieving the original goal. Uh, a sufficiently powerful optimizer will not do that. So uh, the example that uh, Eliezer Yudkowsky, the founder of the Singular Institute, likes to give is it's Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi does not like to kill people, and you offer him a pill that will make him a killer. He'll reject that. Of course, after the pill, he'll want to kill people. But before the pill, he's someone who wants less murder in the world, and taking the pill will cause more murder to exist in the world. So uh, although we humans may shift, a sufficiently powerful optimizer will not. And th therefore, that's not a reason that a superintelligence would converge on benevolence. So far, I've talked about reasons why a superintelligence might do good to others. Now we'll talk about an AGI, or a superintelligence as a moral patient. And here, uh, we have to consider our intuitions. Can uh, artificial intelligence suffer? Well, there are reinforcement systems. And uh, even today, there are AIs, of course, not general ones, that work on that basis. So if we're feeding in a certain number, it goes from, let's say, 0 to 127, and the larger numbers are what we call reinforcements, is it evil to lower that number on today's simple systems? I don't think anyone has the intuition that that's evil and that those simple systems are moral patients. If we imagine a much more sophisticated general intelligence that works on a similar basis, and that can really get things done, it can achieve goals, it can work in the world to do whatever you ask it to do, world peace, human happiness, curing AIDS, defeating the enemy in battle, this is a very sophisticated intelligence that nonetheless is trying to maximize for something and is it sad that number is reduced? Well, sadness and pain are mechanisms created by evolution to push us to uh, achieve certain of evolution's goals. So uh, if we have a romantic breakup, we're sad. That's because it's reduced our reproductive fitness. Of course, we humans don't think that we're working for the sake of evolution, and we often don't. We have birth control. But nonetheless, the mechanisms are created by 
evolution. So if we have these mechanisms of pain, of sadness, I should also say of, of joy, I don't know if a future artificial general intelligence would have these exact mechanisms. Maybe it would, in which case that would be a human-like mechanism, and in which case perhaps that would mean that it's a moral patient. But I would say that as a first step, uh, an optimizer whose job it is to maximize a certain function can't really be said to be experiencing human feelings like joy or sorrow or pleasure or pain, and that I would not call that a moral patient. You may have a different intuition. There's another aspect of uh, the moral patient concept, and that's empathy. So we feel a dog's pain when it's hurt because we recognize that the noises and the squirming that it has are similar to ours, and that's a very valuable feeling, of course. We wouldn't feel that for a machine whose number had just been lowered. Now, if you had a machine that squirmed and shouted, we'd probably feel uh, anthropomorphizing sympathy with them. And I think uh, we can agree that if that's simply faked up, if you have a cartoon, an artificially generated cartoon of an entity which is shouting in pain, that we should not really treat that as a moral patient. Where do these concepts come together? Of an entity trying to optimize a function and succeeding or failing, of an entity displaying behaviors like a smile, like a frown? Do these, ent do these concepts have to come together for us to really think something's a moral patient? Probably they do, and that probably wouldn't be the case for a generic artificial general intelligence developed in the future. To go back to uh, some of our examples of a uh, non-human optimizer, we can ask if these are moral uh, agents or patients. Uh, markets. You might say markets are suffering when they go down, uh, although then again, some people sell short to make money. Let's not confuse the markets and the people participating in the markets. Markets are a total abstraction. They're numbers flashing around somewhere. They have no pain response. It jitters up and down the humans who are being happy or sad. Markets are, we may anthropomorphize and get angry at the New York Stock Exchange. No, I don't think so. I think we get angry at certain traders who we feel have uh, committed misdeeds. Likewise, um, when the U.S. housing market crashed, people felt sad for uh, those humans who couldn't pay their mortgages. They weren't feeling sad for some abstract concept of the market. Likewise with evolution. If an animal species is uh, extinguished, we may feel sad for the specific animals. We may feel sad for humanity, which has lost a beautiful treasure. We may even feel sad for an anthropomorphized ecosystem, which has lost a species. But do we feel sad for evolution as a concept, as abstraction? No. It's not a moral patient. Do we get angry at evolution for creating diseases that make people suffer? Do we get angry at evolution for uh, making the famous uh, Ich Neumann wasp that eats out uh, the, uh, the inside of the wasp while keeping it alive? No. Our intuitions do not treat these non-human optimizers as moral agents or patients. And likewise, computers today, although we may slam our fist into the computer, uh, that's merely a metaphor. Most people will agree computers are not really moral agents deserving of our condemnation. You're free to smash up your computer with a baseball bat. It doesn't care. AXI is a mathematical formalism. That's all it is. It's a way of stating that we're going to try all the possibilities, an infinite number of possibilities, on every cycle, every second, you might say. We're going to choose the best one and then cycle again. And that's it. What's, what's to blame? Or what's to feel sorry for? What's to feel happy for? These are non-human optimizers that are not moral agents or patients, even though in some cases they're very powerful, as I mentioned. To summarize, I'd like to remind us of the Copernican revolution. The fact that science has taught us over and over in different fields that humans are not central. In astronomy, our planet is not central to the universe. In biology, our species is not central to the animal kingdom. We're merely one branch on this tree, on this bush of life. And uh, we're also not special, which is to say just as there is a planet Earth, there are other 
planets, uh, around the sun, around other stars, and although uh, today we haven't found any human species, the general trend is to suggest that humans are really not that distinct in so many ways. Biology has taught us that um, every aspect of human biology is reproduced elsewhere in the animal kingdom, although perhaps not our general intelligence. And I want to suggest that we have to take the Copernican revolution into philosophy, specifically the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of ethics. We are not central, we are not special. Yes, today we think that way, just as people used to think that our planet was central to the universe. But once new optimizers arise, then we'll realize that we are mer merely one of many. We will be merely one of many. And they will have a completely different relationship to the concept of morality, to the concept of being a moral agent and a moral patient. Although I should say that the flip side is that we're not special. And maybe if in the future we develop machines that have very human-like characteristics when it comes to morality, that humans will not be the only moral agent and moral patient in the universe, specifically if brain simulations create very human-like intelligences, or if brain augmentation creates a sort of cyborg that is in some extent human-like, and if this similarity of humans is an area of morality, that very complex and hard-to-define area, then yes, we humans will not be special. To take the flip side of the Copernican revolution, we humans are central. We are special. Every astronomer to date has seen the universe either from planet Earth or from uh, near the planet that we live on. So in astronomy, we are central. This is the anthropic perspective. And likewise, in terms of biology, we're special because we're the only thinking animal that can consider our relation to other animals. We can do a lot more. We can kill them. We can dominate them. We are central in a certain sense. And likewise, when it comes to the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of ethics, we are central. And that's because it all comes from us. Morality, like sexiness, is something that comes out of the evolved human brain. All our analyses of potential future minds are our analyses. So, although we must change our philosophy of mind and of ethics to take a broader perspective, let's not forget that we are the ones creating that perspective. I'd like to take your questions now. I'm delighted to be a Singularity Institute Research Associate working in Israel, and I hope to have the opportunity to collaborate with many of you in the future. And this is an opportunity to take some questions.